And now to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. How exciting. We've been waiting a long time to get this band in here. We celebrate them today and their longevity. Yay! I mean, look at that. How many bands, <laughs> boys? How many bands? Good to see all of you. Hello, how hi. many bands have this kind of longevity? Very few. You guys have done it. You beat the odds. You write great albums, great songs. I was watching Flea. Flea, I was watching you, the, um, the tape of you playing um, the Star Spangled Banner on your bass at the, uh, at the basketball game the other night. My God, that was, I didn't know you could turn a bass into something that sounded like a lead guitar. You know what I mean? It was very, very awesome. Uh, congratulations. Yeah, I, woke up in the, I woke up in the morning, uh, yesterday morning, or the mother morning before I did the anthem, and uh, my two favorite anthems that I know of of all time are Marvin Gaye's one at the All-Star Game that he did in 1983, and Jimi Hendrix's one at Woodstock, which was kind of, you know, a comment on the Vietnam War and stuff. Right. And uh, watch those ones, and they're both just so beautiful that I tried to internalize them and I hope that I might get lucky and get a little bit of that emotion in there. And I was, you know, I was excited because Anthony and Chad were there watching. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to besmirch the band name and do a, do a shitty one. <laughs> no, no, it was quite impressive. In fact, um, I, I, I was impressed because to me it would be intimidating to do the Star Spangled Banner on guitar in light of Jimi Hendrix, you know, because he, he made it so iconic, but you were able to do it and make it your own. And, and it was, it was just amazing. I, I loved it. Um, Thank you. you know, the, the, the other thing I, I read was that when Billy Corgan was touring with you guys, he said he saw you play the bass so hard with your, with your fingers that after a Chili Peppers concert, there would be a hole in your thumb that, that <laughs> you would rip a hole into your thumb. That's how hard you go at it. And I thought, that, my God. That used to be a regular occurrence. Um, you know, the nature of our music changed over the years where every song wasn't always bang -a -bang -a -bang -a -bang -a -bang -a so hard. But I used to rip my thumb open and, and uh, had a, I figured out the best way to fix it was to put super glue in the hole and uh, just <laughs> patch it up and turn it into this glue thumb, robo thumb. And that's what I did for years and years and years until... I, I, um, I, I, you know. I hear stuff like that. That's called living on the edge because I'm such a pussy that if I ripped a hole in my thumb, I'd say, that's it. I'm not playing the guitar anymore. It's over. I, I, I hurt myself. I got to, I got to pick up a new instrument, but you, you know, you just stick some crazy glue in there and the, and you keep going. It's, well, it's amazing. We come from the school. I've, I, you know, there's this great photograph of Pete Townsend, like holding up his hand with blood dripping all over his hand. And, um, <laughs> I always, you know, see that as like this pinnacle of, of uh, art and action coming together, like like uh, Yukio Mishima said, and I love that. I love that idea, and that's kind of like the punk rock scene that we came up in together. Was very much like that. It was like this physical thing and the cerebral and the spiritual all coming together in this real wild mix. Yeah, uh, boys, it's good to see you all together. I mean, this is uh, this is really something to get you up early in the morning doing this. Did you guys go to bed super early, or have you been up all night? What was the approach to this uh, to this appearance? Chad Smith uh, got a hotel room in Hollywood as he lives at the beach, and he slept at the old Sunset Marquee. I did. Room four hundred nine, is it? Is that uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, four hundred nine, ladies. We if got anybody a wants rest. to visit, <laughs> you got a little rest. But I had I the like weirdest, that. weirdest dream. I had it's the craziest dream. So I don't know. I mean, you know what Larry David says. What did you say? No one cares. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank God. Chad, what was your dream? What, what, what was? No, 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 no. Oh, 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 oh. No, no, one cares. Cares. no one cares. Someone cares. I don't <laughs> remember. No, no, no. The man it was Chad. Just, it was. Cares. It was really odd. Yeah. I, I, I Chad, what I do care about. Yes, sir. All right. I do actually care about your dream, but what I really even care about is the, the fact that you uh, put up this tribute to Taylor Hawkins, who just died mm. from the Foo Fighters, way too young. Uh, it's very upsetting. Um, uh, on your drum, you have a picture of Taylor Hawkins, and uh, I had Taylor on the show many times. I just thought he was the loveliest guy. Yeah. Um, uh, very upsetting. Uh, um, that's a nice tribute. I mean, I don't, how many times in your career have you put a picture of somebody on your, on your drum? Mm. Uh, not too many, you know, I mean, uh, I love Taylor. Uh, he was one of my best friends. 
um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I'm just, we're still shocked and, and so saddened by his passing. Um, yeah, he loved you, Howard. He was, he was like, um, but does he, he's like, you know, kind of tough. He goes, no, 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 he's great. And Howard's great. He, he always asks like really good questions. He's smart guys, fun. You should do it. You should do it. I was like, well, okay. <laughs> but no, he, I'm glad uh, you did. Yeah. Well, and he loved life, you know, and, and he, um, was a real beacon and, and full of positive energy. Um, I'm going to miss him so much. You know, he was, a, he's a godfather to my son Beckett and, um, you know, we spent a lot of time together. These guys loved him too. We toured a lot back in the late nineties and two thousand, played a lot of shows with the Foo Fighters and, um, you know, I love his family and, and, and just trying to be there for him on every, the outpouring from everywhere. You know, not only musicians, but but people all over walks of life showed, showed how much he was so um, loved. And, um, yeah, when I asked him to be my son's godfather, I said, uh, Taylor, can you, do you think you'd be the godfather to Beckett? And he goes, yeah, of course. Yeah, well, well, well um, you know, yeah, what do I got to do? I go, I, I don't, I think, you know. <laughs> not, not really anything. He goes, okay, great, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at that. You know, that's so funny with the godfather kind of thing. Like, you say to someone, yeah. you be the godfather of my child, and really nobody knows what that means. Well, I mean, it's did he spiritual ha- guidance, I think. Like, if you looked it <laughs> under the, maybe, you know, but he was, uh, you know, he was, and he was he was beautiful, and I'm going to, you know, we're all going to miss him. And um, so, yeah, just, you know, a little tribute, and, and um, uh, you know, I love him. Do you, uh, is it a thing with drummers that, um, do you think you got close to him because you guys can sit there and talk drums specifically? Like he's another guy, he's in your, you know, he's, he's a guy who came up with you, he toured with you and all of that. Is that the yeah. close bond? Would you guys sit and I talk mean, about drumming? It, it, it's part of it. You know, we, we, and we really, you know, on other levels, personal levels, but, but certainly musically. Yeah. I mean, we would often talk to each other and say you know we're both drummers that have been in rock bands that are for a long time still going still relevant and playing stadiums how lucky are we and but we also had uh we're both uh married and and have three small children relatively the same age and so we could often you know talk about just our lives like that you know and sort of it was it was um it was, you know, we crazy wives, crazy lives kind of thing, you know, so. <laughs> when, and, when, when, and it was fun. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, no, because we could, we could really, really on that, that, that level, at, on, on top of, you know, just uh, our, our friendship. I don't know why we get into this on this show, but many times <laughs> I asked uh, Lars from Metallica this question. Who is the greatest drummer of all time? Was it John Bonham? Yes. Neil? It was John Bonham, right? It was not Neil Peart. <laughs> yeah, it was John Bonham, right? Well, why is I think, that's I think what so. I said? Yes. Okay, and, and, I, well, you're a smart, handsome, powerful man. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you for saying you're that. I, I like you're to be right once in a while because he hit. <laughs> what is it? He hit the drums so hard. No, no, and often people think that because of his sound in Led Zeppelin. You know, he he did play with a ferocious energy. But he had the finesse as well. He's not wasn't just a pounder. He played, you know, very dynamically and played beautifully and musically for that music. But he was an innovator, Howard, you know, from the very beginning, from note one of the first Led Zeppelin record, Good Times, Bad Times, he had his sound. Right. And he had his and he had the way he played and and he was doing this thing with his foot that no one was, had really done in rock and roll. And it was all there right at the beginning, 19 years old. That's rare. Of course, he grew and changed as a, as a musician. and But from the beginning, and that band just changed everything from the, the, the kind of tinny 60s to the full Technicolor 70s and that sound and the way they played. But he, to me, was the best rock rock drummer for sure. No, no, no diss to there's many, many other great drummers and a lot of people do, 
Keith Moon and Ginger Baker and a lot of these guys and, and Neil as well. But for my money, it's it's John Bonham. His swing, the swing that he, the way that he played, made that music so uh, you know just danceable. He was incredible. And when you're a young guy trying to figure out how to be a professional musician, what is the trick? You sit there and would you listen to, let's say, Charlie Watts playing the drums on a Rolling Stones record and try to do an imitation of that at first so you can learn how to play the drums and then you find your own style? Is that the trick to it? Uh, that's one way to do it. And I certainly did that. I played along to all my all those records and 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 Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, you, you know, and the list goes on. Yeah, you would put the headphones on you down in the basement and play along to those records and try to emulate the the feel of that and play like that if you could. And uh, it was an exciting thing for a teenager. You close your eyes and you, you think you're in, in Black Sabbath or whatever. You know, it was, <laughs> I loved it. But at <laughs> yeah. some point, at some point, you have to find your own thing. But yeah, that definitely helps uh because uh, you're playing with music you're not just playing by yourself and it's important also to technically to get your chops up and 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 play all the things that you need to do so you can um, realize that what you hear and hopefully facilitate that on your instrument but yeah i mean i'd spend hours in the basement and my mother i grew up in detroit and she would she would say i'm going out shopping now she had to be a good time to practice go, oh, right okay i go downstairs and and then she would flick on the lights on and off when she was home and i'd be like oh wow man a light show yeah. <laughs> this is my first light show <laughs> can you imagine you know my mother was so she goes uh, you can play the clarinet that's a nice instrument you could play uh, piano she goes but i'm not listening to those focaccia drums she would say you know i she wouldn't let me practice like dr- like it's got to be a very tolerant parent who would allow yeah, someone very, to be a drummer yeah yeah yes, you mu- yeah you yeah, must absolutely. love her for that yeah, I, yeah, I do, sure. and she and as much trouble as I got in Howard back in the day, as a young rebel, she never took the dr- drums away from me. She's, uh, you know, I would have, I would get grounded. That was her form of uh, punishment, often for long periods of time. Maybe that's why I got to be so good on, the drum. <laughs> or at least you I did, could play well. Your... Go down and play the drums, and and you know, I couldn't do other things, but she never took that away from me. And I, did they I get to see? Did your mom get to see your great success with the Chili Peppers? Yeah. Or was yeah? Howard, my mother is ninety-five years old. Wow, that's awesome. Living that in the house awesome. in the basement, I'm talking about in the house I grew up with. Still to this day, it's like a Time Warp, you know, museum over there, you know, with the blue shag carpeting and the. And, you know, my little twin bed in my room. And why don't you want to stay here when you come home, Chad? I'm like, Mom, I'm 63 <laughs> now, and I'm 60 years old, but thanks a lot. <laughs> but, yeah. yes, oh, she has. She's been, she's, uh, yeah, and it's one of my great joys to, you know, we, we were just inducted into the walk uh, in Hollywood, and she was so happy, you know, she was like, <gasps> Carol Burnett is on the Walk of Fame. Oh, that's really something. Oh, goodness. That's amazing. You, so. you know, I don't know why I had this impression of the Chili Peppers, but when I was watching you guys get inducted to, the, or whatever you want to call it, to the Hollywood Walk of Fame, you got a star on the Walk of Fame. I could tell it was really meaningful to you. And I, you know, sometimes I go, ah, what's the big deal? What's that? But I guess, mm. especially for Anthony and Flea, growing up in uh, L.A. and, uh, you know, in the California area, you know that that's like a big deal, the Walk of Fame. Maybe more than maybe more than anything, because you never imagine in your life you're going to be up there. You know, it, it it's really crazy. You know, a lot of people don't know. Flea started out as a trumpet player, and uh, and you didn't even like rock and roll. You, you looked down on it as a as a young man. You were kind of like uh, a bit of a musical snob. Jazz is where it's at. This is what I like. But when you look on this. Why, why, why did you pick up the bass and get into a rock and roll band? Um, because I met Halal Slovak. Anthony and I were best friends from when we were 15, when we met just, you know, 10th grade, just turned 15. And um, one day we were out in North Hollywood hitchhiking, and we saw Halal Slovak drive by in his Datsun, his green Datsun B210, 510. What was it called? 210. 510. Oh, 510. A green hatchback. It was the hatchback. It was a hatchback. And um, he picked us up, and we became a threesome and became best friends. And and, uh, Halal played guitar in a rock band. And not long after that, you know, 
actually, you know, like I don't know, like I, within a year, he he had a rock band. He asked me to start playing bass, and um, I had and I never liked rock music at all. Like you said, you know, I right. I grew up in a jazz household, and I and I really admired my stepdad. He was a jazz bass player, and I wanted to be a jazz trumpet player. I got Dizzy Gillespie on my shirt today. I wanted to be like Dizzy Gillespie when I grew up. He was my hero, and. Um, <clears throat> And and I met Halal, and he started playing me Jimi Hendrix and Zeppelin and Rush, and uh, I started developing a real soft spot. And then I'd go with him to his rehearsal, and see him play guitar, and like all the love that he had for it really touched me and, and rubbed off on me. And one day he asked me if I would like to play bass and join his band because he did, wasn't happy with the bass player that they had. And uh, like two three weeks later, I was on stage at Gazari's playing bass and anthem. Unbelievable. And, and, yeah, would you consider so yourself, fun. were you a savant in a way, the fact that you could pick up trumpet and then just say, okay, I'll play bass now and become a world-class bass player? Or do you do you feel that you had some natural ability or was it just your work ethic at the thing that you just attacked the bass and said, I'm going to learn this thing and put in the 10,000 hours? I don't know if it was either. I think at that age, you know, it's much easier to pick things up and just... I was fearless about music, you know, and I was just going to play the way that I could play and do the best that I could. And I was just so in love with the idea and of being in a band and all of us being friends together. Um, and I think I really, more than anything, yearned for that feeling of community and belonging and being with my friends and doing something, you know, and it, that meant so much to me. And all of a sudden, like, kind of girls were talking to me and stuff, and I was such a shy little guy. Um, it was just all so fun and exciting. I, I, I don't know that I had time to even think about it. No, I don't, I don't think that my brain really works in a way that I'm like particularly smart or anything like that. I just was in love with being with my friends and playing. I think that's what I was swept away with and, and romanticizing the music and the music, the rock musicians that I fell in love with, like Zeppelin and Hendrix and stuff. Do you think anybody could learn to be a world-class musician if they worked hard enough at it, or do you have to have some natural talent? I mean, I, 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 I still think you got to have some... Someone once told me you got to be a good mathematician in order to be a good musician, that, that they go hand in hand. Do you guys buy into that at all? I think that everybody has a different relationship to music and rhythm and, and how it affects them. And, like, you thinking about it, John? I, I, heard, I heard an interesting thing about it. The other day i think it has a lot to do with something inside you that makes you feel like it's a matter of death of life or death that you accomplish something like right it's not so much that you're born with some special spark in you but uh the way i heard it described the other day was if somebody gave you a pill like if, if somebody gave a pill to somebody who's who normally has been frustrated by creativity and given up a lot of times if they if somebody made them take a pill that by taking that pill unless they started really expressing themselves creatively within a year they would die mm. they'd surprise themselves with how creative they were capable of being because when i was growing up right. i didn't feel particularly talented especially for the first few years but it seemed like a matter of life and death that i had to become good at this instrument mm. and i think it's whatever puts that in a person that, and, that and john don't that, you, con that that conviction and john don't you say thank god you had that i mean imagine like a, like i wanted to learn how to paint about eight years ago i started painting and it became life and death to me it really did i just wanted to be good at it i wanted to paint and i go thank god i had that because i would have wasted eight years not learning that it, 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 thank god as a kid that passion was there to be a musician it's uh, it's quite incredible. Who is who? Flea isn't the best bass player that ever lived. Jack Bruce of Cream, because someone told me he played chords on his bass, and that's what made him so great. Jack Bruce is a phenomenal bass player. I mean, best is such a relative term. I don't. I, that's impossible for me because, like Lemmy from Motorhead, also played chords, and I right. love the way Lemmy plays so much. Um, there's a lot of great bass players. Like right now, there's Thundercat and Mono Neon, who are two electric bass players that I really am humbled by, their skills and their vision and their style. Um, there's so many great bass players. I mean, 
a lot of people say Jaco Pistorius is the greatest because he was so innovative, but there's you know there's dozens of them. I can't I don't I can't look at it that way. Let me ask you a cultural question. When you guys want, because this band is so great, and you guys really have written just endlessly hit, great hit songs, and we celebrate your new album today, and we're going to get to try to get to everything. But when you watch something like the Grammys, are you like me? Maybe I'm just an old fart, which I am an old fart. But I watch that and I go, it's so mediocre. It's so nice. It's so safe. It's not everybody. I'm not lumping everyone in. But it almost seems like a disappointment, especially, I would think, for the Chili Peppers. Because when you guys came on the scene, I remember the first time I became aware of the Chili Peppers, you did the cover of Higher Ground, Stevie Wonder. I thought that was crazy, like crazy great. Who the hell does a cover of the Stevie Wonder song? You don't even touch something like that and make it a rock and roll song. It was risk-taking. It was edgy. It was, you know what I mean? I just feel disappointed in music today that it's not, it's just not living up to what I expected. Did you see the Grammys? I didn't watch it. Did you see the Grammys? A little bit. Okay. Yeah. How was it? It was okay. (laughs) <laughs> John, you taped it, right? <laughs> I, I don't know that we paid that much attention to the Grammys. Why, though? Is it is it an unimportant thing? Is it is it really just over for the Grammys? Are they? Uh, re- it I'm, just I'm seems not, I'm lame. Not a Grammy uh, an analyst, really. I, I haven't watched was, the Grammys was, for a long time. Was, was the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, was that meaningful to you? Or again, is that sort of in the same league as the Grammys? I, I always feel like I never really care about any of those things, like any accolade. But then when it happens and we get one, then all of a sudden I get all welled up inside and feel like, oh my goodness, we're being seen, you know, we're valued. Because I always feel like us, we're just workers. You know, right. like, like, like this, we just put out this new record, Unlimited Love. Like, for me, like it's great to put out a record, and I'm really proud of it. And I, I look at my three bandmates, and I'm literally in awe of them of what they did. Like, Anthony on this record, uh, for me, it's beyond. It's the greatest work he's ever done. Like, like uh, these guys. Like, I just in awe of them, honestly. But I, I, I just think about it. It's like we just work. We get into a room and we work every day. You know, we get up, we like roll up our sleeves and we go in and we look at each other. And we're like, well, I came up with this little idea. Let's work on it. And each one of us contributes and we just hone and work and refine and create and build stuff. We're builders. <coughs> you know, we like How to How does it work, things. though? Would you, would you explain the process as best as you can to me? In other words, I know that Anthony writes most of the lyrics. Is that right? Anthony, do you write the majority of the lyrics? I, I hope so. <laughs> okay. And, and do you wait for the guys to go somewhere and come to you with a track or, or, or is it like, do, do Chad and John go in a room somewhere with Flea? Do they, do you separate that out? Do you, do you sit in the same room together? How, what is the process? Do you keep a journal where you write down every little sort of poetic thought? How does it, how does it come together, the new album? I, I think the process is that we're not married to a specific process. Okay. And anything goes, and everything goes. And like Flea said, we're, we all like to work, we all like to create, we all like to build something. <clears throat> so on any given day that it could come from, Flea could pop out of his garage, and he's like, I've got this bass line. Or John might have stayed up all night on his living room floor working at an arrangement for some beautiful guitar chords. Or Chad might just play a beat before anybody gets to the studio, and John will walk in and hear the beat and go, there's a song there. Mm. Um, I might be on a train or in a Chevy or on an airplane feeling emotional and start writing words and bring them to practice. Anything right. goes, any, any sound goes, any idea goes, we're going to experiment with everything that somebody comes in with, and then we build on it. You know, sometimes it's more formulated, sometimes it's just a kernel, but there's a look in everybody's eyes when we hear something that resonates with us, and we're pretty open-minded when it comes to sharing creative ideas with each other. And So, so yes. take the song, for example, Under the Bridge, all right? That was a, a big song for you guys. So, Anthony, the guys, you have an experience actually under the bridge. From what I read, you, you went to, I don't know, at the time, uh, either 
buy some drugs or whatever it was, but you were under a bridge and you felt alienated. You felt alone. And you said to yourself, oh, God, this is, this is the feeling of loneliness and it's horrible. And you actually said the lyrics to yourself. Is that, is, is that correct? Is that how it worked? That's not far from the truth. Um, I had certainly alienated myself from the rest of the world. And then I wrote a little poem to myself, which was on the very last page of my notebook and sitting with Rick Rubin. He's like, what else you got? What else you got? And I'm like, that, that's really all I got. And he's like, well, what's this poem on the back page? And I'm like, ah, that's personal. How does it go? So I sang it to him and he said, that's a song. And, um, <clears throat> What do you mean you sang it to him? What, what, what do you well, mean it, you, it you, you with, had the tune in your head? I did. It, the, the, this particular poem came with a built-in melody. <laughs> like um, sometimes, sometimes I feel... You know, like, 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 that is Yeah, the, you, go, you start yeah. going... You, start, you actually had the whole song formed, and you didn't think it was good enough to bring to the band because it's too personal, and Rick says to you, what the fuck, do this. <clears throat> A, I didn't have the entire song worked out, and, and B, the, the whole melody changed when John put guitar chords beneath it or next right. to it or on top of it. Um, it, it. It brought something to the song that the song didn't have when it was just a cappella. Um, See, that, that, that's it wasn't fascinating. That it wasn't good enough. It was just, right. it, was kind of, it was different and it was personal. We hadn't really gone down that road yet, but the cool thing was that when I sang it to anybody in the band, they were like, Oh hell yes! That's let's work on that. And I was like, really? Ah. You sure? And, and that's funny to me that like artists sometimes don't even know what they have. They have gold there. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's the value of Rick Rubin, your longtime producer. That Rick says to you, "Wait, what's that? What's that little scrawl on the back of your journal?" In other words, he mm. gives you the confidence to present it to the rest of the band. Is that accurate? That is. I mean, he's got many attributes, and that is one of them that he recognizes. Great scrawl. <laughs> um, but you know, so, right. so do all of us. Like John is a fantastic example of somebody who sees just something in the rough that, that wants to come to life. And, and he is a master of bringing it to life by facilitating and offering you a, a safe space to work in. By safe space, you mean it would be like if Rick Rubin was sitting there looking in your journal and he said to you, What's that on the back of your journal? And you go, oh, this thing is very personal. And then he reads it and he goes, oh, yeah, that sucks. Don't you know? In other words, <laughs> the safe space is, hey, this is good. This could be something. John offers that to you also. Like John will say to you, hey, this is something we can work with. We all offer it to each other. And, and sometimes, you know, you have to look at your best friend and go, eh, mm, let's, let's try the next thing. <laughs> so that that's part of it too is just being honest and saying I, that that makes me feel something or this this might not. Yeah, it's definitely part of the part of part of a good chemistry in a in a band, uh, especially when you're writing together. That everybody uh, is comfortable feeling vulnerable with each other. You're you're going to be okay. You're really putting yourself out there to the other guys, and you're going to be okay if an idea gets shot down, and you're going to be okay if something feels like you feel kind of unconfident about it and somebody else tells you that that uh that that's something that's really good you feel comfortable trusting them and to bring out that part of you that maybe the reason you were uncomfortable is because it's such a deeply rooted part of yourself and john when you're picking that little guitar part in the beginning of that song under the bridge you said that's a nod to Jimi hendrix right little wing you, you in other words uh that's something that you brought to the band that you were working on separately uh well we had been covering the song um as far as the intro itself that was definitely inspired by a little tidbit that the minutemen used to do mm. but but um but in general, when I heard Anthony sing the song, we had been covering um, Castle. Castles Made of Sand by Jimi Hendrix. And, you know, Jimi Hendrix had this certain type of song, that, that uh, the song Bold as Love, uh, the song Little Wing, the song Castles Made of Sand. They're all in this category of this certain style of guitar playing and chord changes. And uh, we, we covered Castles Made of Sand all through the Mother's Milk tour, so it was in the back of my head that we could do a song like that someday. And when, when Anthony had the under the bridge idea, 
it just seemed like that would be a perfect place to to do a song of that type. You guys are particularly good at uh, covers. I, I I remember watching the wood that Woodstock performance where Flea, you were naked, and uh, and, and people draw a lot of attention to that. But I thought the version of Jimi Hendrix Fire that you guys did on stage that night, I thought that was fucking awesome. I mean, that was a great cover version of a very difficult song to cover. Uh, everything seemed to kick that night. Uh, Anthony, your vocals, uh, the, the guitar work, the drums. Uh, Lee, I don't still know how you don't injure your penis playing naked. I, I don't get it. <laughs> uh, but, God, I'm so jealous of your penis, I can't even begin to tell you. <laughs> It's, a beauty. Uh, it's, it's magnificent. It is just magnificent. If I had a big penis, I'd be naked all the time. I wouldn't wear clothes up, but uh, what am I going to do? I got nothing. I got nothing. But, the, you know, the, the, the idea of covering a song is so fantastic when you do it right. The fact that Higher Ground became such a big hit. Did you have to go to Stevie Wonder and say, we're going to do your song? Uh, do you have to get permission from him to cover it on an album? I think you might have to get it legally at one point, but we just did it. And it's funny because when you mentioned that song earlier, I was thinking the first time I ever played with John Frusciante, we I had a friend named D.H. Poligro who actually played drums in the Chili Peppers for a very short while. He was a drummer of the Dead Kennedys. And um, he said, I have this friend, this kid, he's really ripping on the guitar, let's get together and jam. And, you know, I often, I would jam with anyone, like go over to someone's garage and jam, like hell yeah. And I went over and I jammed with, was jamming with John and D.H. in this garage and uh, at D.H.'s house. And I just started playing that. Like I had, I just, maybe I would played it at home, but I'd never played it before with anybody. And um, John started playing and that was the first time that that had ever been played in that style. And it was the first time I ever played with John. That's yeah, I, re- I remember Flea was... was uh, we were sitting in the car. I think we tried it, and then we listened to it a little bit in the car to get it a little better. Is that right? You know? And and uh, and yeah, Flea was saying what a good idea it would be to 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 do a heavy metal version of Higher Ground. You know, uh-huh. that was your idea, and you you were like, because it was in the '80s when there was so much bad heavy metal, and Flea was like, heavy metal can be so rocking. You know, uh, I don't remember that. Yeah, part. you were you were talking about how a heavy metal, and we were also talking about it in relationship to the Funkadelic song, which we also mm-hmm. played, uh, uh, Alice in My Fantasies. Right. Like it's a heavy metal tune, but that is a heavy metal tune with a deep groove. You know. Yeah. And and so yeah, it was the idea of doing a heavy metal version of Higher Ground, and like that when you mentioned it earlier, Howard, like that's. Uh, a lot, you know, we we definitely weren't thinking like, let's do a really, you know, ambitious, courageous thing, you know, like for us, it was just like, sounds like a cool idea. Let's try it. You know, yeah. usually things are just, you're Fun. just, you're just curious, like, you know, what would happen? Yeah. What, what would happen? You know, I, and this when, is what happened. When, <laughs> Listen to that baseline. Flee, you show off you. Listen to that fucking baseline. And then the drum kicks in. Oh, that's so nice. It's very trippy. Not bad. Did Stevie ever call you guys and say, you know, I like what you did, or you never heard from him? I I actually saw him not too long ago with a good friend of mine, and and he came over and he said, hey, Stevie, what did you think of that, of Chili Peppers? Did you like the way they covered Higher Ground? He goes, I like the publishing checks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it uh, true story uh, yeah well, i don't know i mean and i think i think did, did you mention one time you like saw him and in, 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 and you played it and he he said oh you the way he liked the way you changed the clav part and trans I, no i don't remember that i had a funny experience with him once okay. in a in a hotel lobby in in detroit Okay. Yeah, about it. Okay. <laughs> what was that experience? What happened? <laughs> We're leave well, it was more like I like someone called me and said a road manager or something said Stevie Wonders in the lobby of the hotel, and I was so excited because it's my hero. I I right. love Stevie Wonder, one of my greatest heroes, and I I ran down to the lobby to try to say hi to him, thinking maybe he'd talk to me because of the cover and stuff. And he was sitting there, and I walked up to him, and I was like, Stevie, hi, I, I I'm Flea, I play in the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you know, I just wanted to say hello. We played in your, in your, played your cover and, you know, and, and I, I love you. And I can't remember, but he just kind of 
didn't say a word, just <laughs> straight ahead, not looking at me, not acknowledging me. And I kind of waited, and I felt awkward, and a minute went by, and I said it again, well, I just wanted to say hi, I'm Flea, and, you know, anyways, uh, you know, your, your, your music means so much to me, and anyways, have a beautiful day. I, I, you know, I didn't know what to do, I was just kidding. Yeah. And I thought, you know, and I kind of, like another minute went by, I got more and more and awkward, and he said nothing, ignored me, and I got ready to walk away, and I was kind of walked away, and he goes, are you one of the members? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm the bass player, and... I kind of thought he was like kind of gauging to see if I was full of shit or not, you know. <laughs> he was right. like, oh, okay, uh, hi, would you guys play my fundraiser next month for the <laughs> or something? I can't remember. <laughs> and I was like, you know, however we could be of service, you know, Stevie, I, I, um, if we can. And, and I can't remember. Then we chatted for a minute or something. But since then, I've met him a number of times, and he's always been really generous of spirit and kind and engaging. And uh, I admire him very much. I can't I sing a no, but I... Yeah, go ahead, Chad. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, just for this TV Wonder thing, have you seen the, the uh, Amir's movie, the Summer of Soul movie? Uh, no, I haven't watched it yet. No. Oh, my God. There's there's Stevie Wonder doing a drum solo in that film that is one of the greatest things uh, you'll ever see. And he hear. steals the show. Huh? He steals the show. It's amazing. Like, people think Stevie Wonder, singer... You know, piano player on the drums, which he played the drums on a lot of his records, one of the most incredible drummers. But to see him, like in 19, whatever that was, 69, doing a solo, it's incredible. It's one of the wow. greatest things. You, I mean, it's worth it alone just to, for that. It's yeah. like Anthony said, I think it's the best thing about the film. And it's, it's, but I mean, the whole thing is great. TV Wonder on the drums, none better. Did you know the song uh, Superstition? It was originally. Jeff Beck was playing the drum beat in, in Stevie Wonder's studio. And then, uh, and then Stevie Wonder was playing the clavinet or whatever. And then, and then Stevie Wonder replaced Jeff Jeff's Beck's drums. drums with himself playing drums. <laughs> the intro to that, it's the most simplest thing you could, like, that would be the first thing you would play if you would like, here, here's some sticks and just everything. Just the funkiest four bars there is. Amazing. You know, Chad, I'm thinking, uh, I actually watch American Idol, and I've been watching your daughter on there. Oh. And uh, Ava, I believe her name is. And Correct. she covered Stevie Wonders lately. I wonder if you coached her on that and said, um, <laughs> yeah, here's what Vocally, you need to yes. do. Yeah. Vocally, yes. Yeah. Vocally. Vocally. <laughs> I'm known for my pipes. No, I'm so proud of her. She's, she's uh, yeah, I actually watched her last night. It was great. Yeah. It's a really good experience for her. She's, she's a great kid. I'm so proud of her. Yeah, she's having a good time. She's I don't know how anybody does it. Hard. Yeah, and she's, she's and been it's, it's, hard. it's yeah, yeah. Well, and the other thing about the experience of that stuff is that it it is she's up like we are at five in the morning and doing you know the, this part of it's not just get up on stage and sing your song it's it's what goes into it and uh, it's great it's a really good experience for anybody especially a young person that's never done that before so yeah it's great it is a good experience because you know it breaks my heart in a way some of these kids you got three people judging you on you know. Yeah, whether you can see your daughter that part i don't I, that part uh, I, she's got I, a great I, look I like she comp- can sing i mean she she yeah, looks no. like she could have a career and she's got a father who's a major star i mean uh no, there's a lot they, but like when i see three people judging her and telling her what to do and stuff you sit there and go shit i could never conduct my career that way anthony you would never have gone on american idol a flea wouldn't go no. on there doing the base you know it just it, you just wouldn't you have to to me, it's a scary proposition to have people sitting there judging you. What was great about you guys is when you started out, you'd go to a club or something, I guess, to play those initial gigs. And the audience was the judge, whether they got yeah. up and started moving around. You know, that's it. It's a yeah. very, I can't imagine, very intimidating experience for a kid to be on that thing. Uh, it's just freaking. Anthony, do you remember... Do you have a memory? Because when he mentioned the song lately, and I didn't know Ava played it, mm. but us sitting in Scood's house in the 80s listening to Lately, like those specific... I remember uh, one time and it was like I was brought to tears. Yes, I do remember listening to Lately with you and Dondi Bestone. And as soon as I heard that Ava had sung Lately, yeah. I was like, Chad, that's a great song. That's one of my favorites. We, we used to get down with that song. But I just wanted to say to Ava... Yeah. She's been playing music for yeah. 10, 11, 12 years. She's, yeah. She put in the, the time. She's putting it in. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember a, a while ago, I guess it was a couple of years ago now, maybe actually probably like four years, like 
Anthony and I were going to a Laker game together, <clears throat> and we're walking up, and we're a little bit late, and the anthem's already happening, right? And, you know, we walk in, and I'm like, gosh, someone's really doing a good anthem tonight. This is beautiful. <laughs> and we have no idea who it was. And we walk in, and someone's singing. I'm like, who is that? I know that person doing the anthem. And it was like a really good one. That's like no show off, just like beautiful from the heart. And uh, it was Ava. <laughs> I was so mind blown. Because I, I never say that walk into an anthem, like, oh, it's the anthem. You know, like, let's get the ball rolling. And it was so like we were just blown away. Yeah, I was thinking Ava's going to win American <laughs> Idol, but I don't know. I mean, you know, I really oh, you was. got a lot of pull. You got a lot of pull. You do you, those, those shows. I people know, yeah, you people listen Come to on. me. I'm you, telling yeah, you, I, I, yeah, I can get her the You're a powerful man. Come on. No, she's a very, very talented girl. She can really sing. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like uh, it, it could be awfully horrible to have your kid go on there and be humiliated because you only want good shit for your kid. You know, you just want them to be okay. And I could just imagine she probably gets the initial reaction. Oh, so your dad's in the Red Hot Chili Peppers and you think you're so great. You know, like I'm sure there's a knock against her immediately because she has a famous musician father. Well, you know what? She has been very, um, uh, uh, she's been very good about making sure that that is not the case. It's not, it's not this nepotism thing. It's, it's she's for her whole career. If she has a young person, it's, she does not go down that route. My dad, this stuff, she does wants to do it on her own, whatever, wherever she wants to go for any of my kids. And especially for her, there is not, it's not, um, you know, I'm getting the leg up because of who my father or what he does or any of that sort of stuff. She makes it a point and has in that television show. I'm not there or any of that sort of thing. I'm supporting her, but it's not any of that. And, and it's, I, I commend her and applaud her for being so mature in that way. It's really, I'm really proud. Boys, this new album, you know, it's getting a lot of good reviews. And, you know, a lot of bands kind of rest on their laurels after a while. When you've had as many hits as the Red Hot Chili Peppers, you could have, like, just kept touring, uh, doing your thing, uh, playing playing the hits. But you went and, you you know, you made a new album and, and, and you're going to have great success with it. It seems to me John... Is a, it must be great for the three of you to have John back in the band because John seems to be that catalyst, that, that guy who makes you guys elevate your game. Uh, is that a fair assumption to make? Because every time John's in the band, the, 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 band, the band just seems like it, it goes to a certain level. John, that's, a good, that, that's a fair assumption. He is a yeah. he's be, he's more than a catalyst. He is a catalyst, but he's our brother. He's our family, and I think just being around him and seeing how much he pours into what he does is infectious. It's contagious. Um, it's inspiring, literally inspiring. Not just like oh wow, I'm inspired, but he offers ingredients and love and hard work and a cosmic ability to listen to the air around him and constantly conjure and produce sound and song and emotion so for sure it makes us want to do better work harder but it's also just fun like yeah getting writing songs is fun and waking up with nothing but going to sleep with something is a very satisfying feeling and it's satisfying in a for free and for fun way it wasn't we didn't try to go write some hits in fact <clears throat> we kind of went the other way and went back to basics of just jamming, playing blues songs, playing old Red Hot Chili Pepper songs from the early 80s. And whatever came, came. You know, it wasn't uh, something we were trying to manufacture. Uh, what was it have, like for uh, you guys? What was it like for you guys not to have John in the band? Like, what, And John, what was it like for you to watch the Red Hot Chili Peppers do their thing and be away from the band? Was it good for you to have some time off and just kind of... I don't know, regenerate or get, get new ideas. I would think when you're in one of the biggest bands in the world, it must have been really difficult for you to step away. Um, <clears throat> I didn't spend any time regretting it. I, I, it was the right thing for me to do at the time. And I really didn't pay attention to rock music in general, other than the old stuff that I'm attached to. Uh, but, but, uh, but yeah, I was just making electronic music and they were living in one world and I was living in another one. So yeah, I wasn't 
I wasn't paying attention, really. What made um, you ready to come back for this album? Uh, it was a certain amount of, of uh, soul-searching that I'd done and uh, conversations with my closest friend where a couple of my closest friends where um, I fe- it seemed like I had changed and grown enough as a person to where there were certain things that I wanted to, I, I wanted, uh, it felt like it would be a beautiful thing to have another chance to do it right. I felt that way when I rejoined the first time, uh, right. was that, that, uh, on a personal level and on a musical level, I had some new ideas about where, where I thought those relationships could go. And, uh, and, and it was the same thing this time. I just, I, I was seeing Anthony and Flea and Chad through a different lens than I had seen them through when I quit. Not that either time that I quit, that it was specifically anything to do with personal, but, you know, having a personal relationship in a band is, is a hard thing. You've got to be in sync with four people working as hard as they work, doing, you know, going where they go, doing what they do, almost thinking what they think every day. It's an intense thing to do, you know, and so I've found for myself that, that, that I've, needed a, I've needed to clear my head of it and re- try to figure out who I am as a person. And where I had gotten to in 2019 before I rejoined for the second time, uh, I really wanted to have that, have that closeness and that kind of vulnerable interaction with them again. Yeah, that's where it had, had come from for me. Must have been great for you guys, though. You must have been like, oh, wow, John wants to come back. It must have been really kind of a no-brainer, right? Or, or did you guys have some discussion and say, gee, could, there, could we go back and, and, and just start working again together? I mean, there was definitely something in the air because without knowing that John wanted to come back and without knowing that Flea had been having interactions with John musically, um, suddenly I felt very overwhelmed with the feeling of, how do we get John back? And, right. uh, and Flea and I had a very classic moment where we went to each other to say something important, and he's like, I got to go. And I was like, no, I got to tell you something. I got to... And it was just in the air. It was time for John to come back. And I was shocked when Flea told me that that John was interested and that he had been playing with John. And, um, you know, there were were no hard feelings. There were no resentments. There were no regrets. Um, The fact that we were able to kind of keep keep things going while John was away was sort of perfect in the end because we were available when, when he showed up and it was time for change. And we felt you know, that in but, our, our... Yeah, I mean, I feel like you four musically just get each other and it's really nice to see the whole band together. You know, before you guys do Under the Bridge, I, I want to go back to December 1991 and paint for my audience the fact that you guys, when... when um, when, when Blood, Sugar, Sex, and Magic came out, it was an amazing time in music when you think about it. Mm. And to put it into some kind of perspective, you guys were on the road with Pearl Jam as the opening act, Nirvana was in the middle, and you guys were the closers. That is an amazing moment in music. It, it, that's why I brought up the Grammys and how come it seems so lame to me sometimes. What a rebirth of music. I can't imagine what that tour must have been like. You guys had an album that was really breaking big. Pearl Jam was coming out with 10. And Nirvana, we know what, what happened with them. What was that tour like back then? But, but before you do Under the Bridge, because I want to just remember what it, and how long you guys have been doing this. That must have been amazing stuff going on between the, the three bands. I think we were all, I mean, I don't know, it was a, a much different experience for all of us, um, personally. I just remember it, it was another tour, and, like, we made a record that we were really proud of, and we wanted to go pour our souls into it, and we're dealing in this situation that we are talking about before, this communally creative situation, and that 
that was the thing that I remember the most, like it was it's always intense and it was always, at everything we had ever done, it had always been, we're going to play this show like I'm about to get shot in the face or killed by an ax murderer right after the show. Every note like it's your last note. That was something we always said, play every note like it's your last. Mm -hmm. And so we always go out there with that attitude and that feeling that our lives depended on, on this is our statement to the world. Um, and that particular show, no, they were just good bands, man. Like Nirvana had just put out Nevermind. You know, Pearl Jam was, was just kind of the newbies. They were up and coming. They had made their first album. And, you know, I had gone backpacking with Eddie and knew him for many years before he was ever in Pearl Jam. You know, he was a friend of our original drummer's, Jack's. So it was nice. I was like, wow, he sings in a rock band now, and, and they have a hit record, and we're on tour together. <laughs> yeah. Like, it was all just meaningful and of the moment and organic and flowing. It wasn't uh, like, oh, we're with these bands, and they're really big, and this is, it was just, we were doing our thing. Would you, you know? watch these guys? Would you feel competitive with these other bands? In, in, in the sense that when you go on stage, and I've heard other musicians talk about this, you want to be, especially if you're the closer, you want to be the band that blows everyone out of, out of their fucking minds. Like, you want to close that and kind of like, I want to say almost put every other band in its place. Like, now, you know, now the Chili Peppers are here. Fuck you guys. We're, we're taking over. Because you don't want to tank in front of that audience. There is a competitiveness mm -hmm. to it all, isn't there? I, I I never felt particularly competitive with them. I always feel like when we go on stage, like we are going to obliterate the fucking universe. Right. But mm -hmm. I remember just feeling like, like you know, they're good bands, uh, but Nirvana, that they were really carrying a heavy magic with them. Like just this feeling like they are a powerful entity. To be respected, yeah. right? <clears throat> yeah, it's you guys... something I was. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, please, John. Go ahead. Oh, it was, um, it's something else that I was thinking in relationship to that thing that makes a musician develop into a into a good musician. It's also the same in a band. Like when when we were playing together in you know eighty eight, eighty nine, like like when we were still playing in clubs, it really felt like a life or death thing that we we had to succeed at what we were doing you know like like not just commercially but like our shows had to have an energy our shows had to move people people had to be dancing you know like uh that has so much to do with that thing that you were talking about as far as how we elevate each other's ability you know they make me a better guitarist like we 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 uh that chemistry that thing that makes us better our styles were in large part developed because we were under that, we put ourselves under that pressure of wanting to be good, not comparing it to anybody, but wanting to be able to explode together when we stepped on stage and keep that explosion going for the whole concert. Like, do you mean, John, do you mean because the, the, um, the, it's not so much whether Nirvana was good before you uh, that that were just on the stage. It's just you set up you set up this thing where you imagine, it, with knowing all the history of rock and roll, you're now in front of an audience. We just want to make this the biggest event possible, and when you pull it off, there's no greater high, right? When you get an audience completely taken with your performance. I've heard musicians say that's why that's why drugs occur because you can't even come down off the high when you get off the stage after you've you know performed in front of all these people and they're going berserk. Is, is that the thing? Is that that high the thing you're chasing? It, it really meant a lot to us. I think it's more that God-given thing that you were talking about. You know, like for some right. reason, it really meant a lot to us to 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 be able to create a certain intensity feeling in the room that we were in when we were playing even at rehearsal you know like um and you know yeah there were there were times when there were people in the band uh early on who who it didn't mean as much to and that the band couldn't have become the same thing if 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 everybody wasn't like this means everything to me my life is over if this doesn't work you know right if any uh, member of the it, band it, hadn't had that attitude, it would have been a failure. Yeah. Yeah. None of the, yeah. none of the individual members could have possibly been as good, you know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. That's incredible. You know who was good? Nirvana. They sure were. 
when we played with them, yeah, yeah. they were just good. No, those. I mean, that was a life changing. What do you mean, Anthony? Yeah. What do you mean they were just good? Like they, 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 what was it? You know, I feel like some of this is a natural thing. Like John, John has a very clear understanding of <clears throat> dynamics and 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 then there's you have to have an idiot in the band, which is me. Um, you know, I have these kind of savanty mathematical eggheads and, and, you know, people that can compute complicated music and then you need a little balance. Um, <laughs> and so for me, the, that feeling that John is so beautifully describing, it was just natural. The first time that we ever played, it was just natural to have an energy, to have a, a passion and have a, a live or die um, aesthetic to everything that we did. But I feel like Nirvana had that naturally as well. Like they, they were certainly good at their at, at their instruments and songwriting and chemistry and all that but then they also just had a combustibility that that came with birth or came from god or came from the planets or something anthony did you get it, to hang out did you get to hang out with kurt cobain and talk about being a front man i would imagine you being around <laughs> uh other front men so to speak uh would be important yeah, to you I, uh, I mean, I, I was usually pretty nervous when I, whenever I was hanging around with him, um, just because I was in awe, and and he wasn't the type who wanted to discuss being a front man. He was just kind of shy and in his energetic s- <laughs> state. But uh, Flea and I had some some nice moments with him at a some MTV show where we snuck away and went backstage and just sat with him while he was getting ready to play. And that was a nice experience. Um, I sat with what, him. What was unusual about it that uh, that he was uh, sitting and playing and and kind of loose as a goose and like uh, loose. Feeling com- he was yeah, loose, and, loose. And, and and warm and inviting and relaxed. And it wasn't like he had been on tour for a long time and was all you know emotionally chaotic. He was quite within himself and said, "Yeah, come right. and sit." And yeah, um, he was a beautiful dude, and he, and he left us with a ton of unbelievable music and energy and uh have you ever you sat just, you, with you go ahead say say it you no know, you brought up playing you know that that little tour with him and by the way the smashing pumpkins were also on an incarnation of that tour for quite some time which was very inspiring they were a wild and beautiful band um have i ever sat with who have you ever sat with um like like someone in rock and roll where you said look I front the band. I, I want a mentor, not, not even a mentor, but, but to sit and to say to someone, you know, even the idea of whether I dance around on stage or stand still during it, you know, do, do you ever sit there and have somebody you can open up to who you feel is uh, somebody worthwhile who could advise you even on, on how to deal with all this, whether the fame or to deal with the just, God, fronting a band, especially when you have these three musicians who are so good. The pressure must be insane on you to keep your voice healthy. Uh, it's, you know, they talk about frontman-itis or lead singer-itis or whatever, but it, it, it's almost, it's, it's an incredibly difficult job. Is there anyone you can turn to and talk to about that if it's not Kurt Cobain? Who is it? Uh, mainly Robin. Ro- Robin is kind of my mentor in that. No, I don't consider myself a frontman. I just consider myself no? part of the band. I mean, we have four frontmen, and... Right. You know, it's it's never been about a man. It's just always been about the boys. Um, and so that, I don't feel all the pressure. I mean, I've got Flea next to me. I've got John next to me. I've got Chad next to me. There's, it's pretty well distributed. Um, and I don't really need another musician to speak to. I could, I could talk to my gardener or, you know, anybody, uh, my sister. So... The itis, we all have an itis. We all feel a little bit of pressure sometimes, but um, I don't. I don't feel like I commiserate with other singers over the itis. I think that's just a human condition. Do you think that's what held the band together? The fact that you're not sort of carrying on like a diva. Hey, I'm. You know, you don't get the. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it helped. Why are you laughing? Uh, <laughs> oh, he is a diva. Uh, just <laughs> no. We're all team players. That that, that yeah. helps. Yeah. Team know. divas. <laughs> it's funny You're... when you you brought up that tour in particular and talking to Anthony about the pressure. One of the things that I really remember about that tour is is um, that I was completely losing it on that tour. 
that I was like, um, it was like uh, I felt so much stress and not because, you know, we had become more famous or anything. I think it had just come to a point, like you're talking about like having someone to talk to. And I remember feeling so lost and I was so, I'd gotten divorced and I, we were out on the road and I, I was struggling so hard just to like sleep and be okay and not fall apart and feeling this enormous anxiety that I didn't even know was anxiety at the time because I was so lost in it. But looking back, I feel like, gosh, I wish there would have been someone who could kind of have a bigger picture who I could sit and be like, like, I'm scared to death. I can't sleep. I'm miserable. I, I, I've never been more sad in my life, which was my feeling on most of that tour. And, um, and ultimately, you know, it was just life that had to teach me to, to uh, let go and surrender to the process and be grateful to be playing music with people that I love and care about. But, but man, it was all, it was just this wild thing. It was just steamrolling ahead, you know, by force of the music itself and by the zeitgeist of the, the cultural time that we found ourselves in, you know. Uh, was yeah. the anxiety flee that oh my God, what are we doing with our lives kind of thing? Like, uh, what if this doesn't work out? Am I fucked in life? Uh, you know, should I have a day job? Uh, you know, or wh what was the anxiety? I mean, the Chili Peppers were, you know, sort of happening and getting it all together and uh, put out a good album. Seems to me like you would have been on top of the world. It was our time of our, our first big breakthrough into being huge. I mean, it it wasn't like we ever had a giant breakthrough, but if we ever did, that was the one, right? I mean, right. when Blood Sugar came out, like which we had been playing for years and playing clubs. I think it was just I felt overwhelmed, you know, by the quantity of work and by, you know, and then John left. Um, it was just like everything was just kind of spiraling, and I felt like I couldn't, uh, I felt overwhelmed and couldn't deal with the quantity of stuff. I just wanted to go and hide in the woods and go to sleep. I remember I'm sure when it I was happens. Reading... Oh, sorry, go ahead, John. Yeah, go. No, please. Oh, I'm just saying. I'm sure it. I'm sure it happens in all kinds of professions. You you strive for something and then you achieve that thing, and you realize I'm still the same. Nothing <laughs> changed. <laughs> you know, like I, I still have to live with myself. Like <laughs> it, it's almost a, this big disappointment that happens because you realize like. Like, I, uh, you think it's going to solve all your problems, mm -hmm. and then you realize, okay, nothing solves those problems except somehow if I can go deep in myself or something. I really have to, I don't know, it just comes as a shock to, to realize that, that achieving your dreams doesn't actually make you a, a more happy person or a more content person. And, is that what blew your mind, John? Like, when you, were, when you left the band, you were like, oh, shit, this isn't solving any of my problems. I've got some issues here, and I thought that being famous and having a some huge success would solve everything. And then you go, "Oh shit!" No, I, I, I think I, I think I, I didn't have a lot of illusions about success uh, in that way. Like I, that was an aspect of the feeling for sure. Was, uh, and a kind of a defensiveness of I'm allowed to feel like shit. Everybody's telling me I'm supposed to be happy, but I, I would think. Well, I wasn't. You know, I was just thinking that maybe you quit because success wasn't everything you dreamed it was. That's why I thought you quit maybe the first time. I don't know. That's an aspect of it. But I, I you know, I, I also admired a lot of people growing up who would tell me this same message, you know, in interviews and stuff. I didn't 